Our keynote speech is from Professor Geeta Mishra. Um, Professor Mishra, Mishra is a National Health and Medical Research Council Principal Research Fellow and Director of the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health, which Minister Hunt talked about today and, and looking at uh, extending it in perpetuity, which is a bold statement, so that's very impressive. Um, she's internationally recognised for her contribution to research on the life course epidemiology and women's health. Uh, her specific focus is on the factors that affect reproductive health from menarche to menopause and the influence of reproductive health across the life course. So if you could join me in welcoming Professor Mishra. Um, before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I also like to thank um, Jean Hales for giving us the opportunity to um, talk in today's symposium. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you some of the research that we are doing, why we're doing it, and some of the exciting opportunities uh, for the future. As uh, Aaron says, I take a life course approach to women's health, so today I'm going to talk about the life course approach to uh, non-communicable disease. So basically, to take a big picture view, I think we need to address three questions. And what I'm going to say is what you've heard yesterday, uh, both Jane Fisher and um, Vijay Roche talking about it. First of all, I'm going to say, why do we need to take women's health specifically? And it, this is in terms of chronic disease. Why do we need to look at women separately to men? Why do we need to take a life course approach? And I'll be giving a little bit of definition of what is a life course approach. And finally, why use large data sets? And in, you find that you know, in all the recommendations that we've been seeing through that's floating around the last few days from the uh, consultations with the different groups, everybody is saying we need more data. So we already, I'm basically selling to the convert, but I will do it anyhow. Okay, so first of all, I first would like to underline that we need to consider NCDs, and that's like uh, non-communicable disease, in many ways as being distinct in women than, and men. We can't just assume that what happens to men will be applicable for NCDs among women. Okay, and this is due to a number of reasons. First, the prevalence and timing of NCDs can be quite different. For instance, the prevalence of depression, lifetime prevalence of depression, is about twice than of that in men. The way NCDs develop in women can be different and can pose greater risk. And I'll give you an example. For instance, heart disease is more deadly in diabetic women than in diabetic men. And of course, there are a range of NCDs that are specific to women. So for instance, your gynecological cancers. And these typically involve some aspects of a women's reproductive function. But it turns out that reproductive factors specific to women, so for instance, age at her first period, pregnancy complications, the experience of menopause, act as a kind of a biomarker or an indicator for her future health, as all these have associations with major NCDs, and therefore, women's health is more than just reproduction. It includes non-communicable diseases in later life. So why do we need to take a life course approach? And as I says, said, you've heard um, both Jane and Vijay talking about it. I think we need to take a live course approach because NCDs uh, normally takes a long period to develop, and it can be a result of a combination of factors over time, right? So the live course approach to women's health looks at what is happening at each stage of her life, even when she was still in the womb, through early life and childhood, through to adulthood and reproductive years into older ages. When we talk about life course, we think about it focuses on the timing and the duration of factors across life. 
So you can think about when is the best time to intervene to reduce the burden of the conditions later in life. So that's taking a big picture uh, view instead of having a, a siloed approach. Now I'll give you an example of a life course approach that uh, we put together for NCDs. So it looks complicated, but what it does is that it provides us with a framework to understand all the factors across life. And if you see it, it is really complicated, but that is life. We need to encompass that and do our best to disentangle it. So we can look at all the key reproductive characteristics across the life, how they individually affect um, chronic disease and how they combine and interact as a kind of reproductive history across life to influence NCDs. Okay? We can take into account social lifestyle factors such as smoking and diet. Um, and also, yesterday you've heard um, the, the presentation from Jen, you know, looking at um, things such as abuse and domestic violence because all these affects women's health. So we need to look at all these pictures in relation to her uh, reproductive and health outcomes. So just quickly uh, to get an idea, a quick example, we know that early life factors such as birth weight uh, is associated with timing of monarchy. Uh, we also know, and I'll demonstrate with some of the results we've got, that the timing of monarchy, the age at which the women first get her periods, also influences her age of menopause. Then it doesn't stop there, because we know that the age at which a woman gets menopause influences her CVD risk, chronic conditions. And I'm going to demonstrate some of these uh, association using data. So basically, we need to understand the complex interrelationships across all these factors is needed to guide in the targeting and timing of preventive strategies. When do we intervene? What happens? Uh, and bearing in mind that some of the characteristics we can't change, you know, age of monarchy has happened. I can't change that. What can I do? to stop, uh, reduce my risk of chronic disease in later life. And I think we all need to be thinking about it. So a lot of the work that's been done uh, previously in, in this uh, space of life course epidemiology has been hampered by um, individual studies that are constrained by small sample size and a lack of control for existing conditions. But there's one study, and um, as Aaron mentioned and also Minister Hunt mentioned, that can help us to disentangle some of these things is the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health. Um, this is a national flagship study that began in 1996, um, and it's funded, as you know, by the uh, Federal Government Department of Health, the founding director, uh, was Annette, Professor Annette Dobson, and I took over the directorship from her five years ago at, based at UQ. We also have a partner, uh, and it's jointly run by the University of um, Newcastle. So for all of you here, the study aims to examine social, psychological, physical, and environmental factors which determine good health and also those that cause ill health in women through adult life. This longitudinal study has over 57,000 women with three age cohorts that were recruited in 1996. Um, and um, in 1996, they were recruited via uh, the Me Medicare or the health insurance database. And then in 2012, 13, we started another cohort of uh, women who were born in 1989-95. They were 18 to 23 now, and they, now they're in their late 20s, and that was done entirely through social media. So the key thing about this study is that we've been, we followed these women up. The three main cohorts, we followed them for over 20 years. And so you can really look at what's happening, how they accumulate chronic conditions as they age. The, these cohorts are broadly representative of the population at the time of recruitment, and we deliberately oversample women from rural and remote areas. The survey uh, data has been collected 
Um, the women filled in questionnaire and the frequency at which they filled in questionnaire range from six monthly, which is the oldest cohort, and they are almost approaching 100 years, um, and also annually, depending on which cohort you're looking at. So the latest cohort, we send out questionnaire every year. The important thing about this is that the survey data is also linked with these administrative data sets, and that's what you'll hear Ingrid talking about this afternoon in terms of endometriosis. We're able to look at hospital data and diagnosis to get the prevalence of endometriosis. Um, by linking it with some of this administrative data, you can also talk about health service use and, and so forth. Important thing here is that it is a um, national asset. It's resource. It's your data as much as anybody else's uh, because it's funded federally. We have uh, to date over 1,200 collaborators nationally and internationally. Uh, currently, we have around 500 uh, active researchers. We've provided government reports. Uh, peer review papers, and also more importantly, I think, is that we're building the next generations of leader by doing capacity building. So it's all there, and if you have some questions and hypotheses that you want to test, you can apply and you'll get the data. So what is important about this study is that we use this, it was instrumental uh, for us and in my research program to form uh, an international consortium. So. Um, this is a cross, it's called Interlace, um, and it is a cross-cohort, cross-cultural collaborations that aims to provide detailed and integrated approach to life course, um, approach to women's reproductive health and future health outcomes. The um, thing here is that Interlace took about, initially when we started Interlace, there were 10 uh, studies from different countries. Now we have uh, 26 uh, data sets from 26 different studies from 11 countries. And as you can see, that's the map um, of it. But in terms of being an epidemiologist and having confidence in our results, we have data from 800,000 women from across the world. Now, why this is important? is that, say, for instance, we want to think about changing policy where we think, you know, say, age or monarchy is affecting cardiovascular disease. What you want to be able to do is to, you'll get a lot more confidence in your results if that association is the same in another country. You know, so the Chinese women, you also see the same association. In, in British women, you're also seeing the same association. association. By doing that, you get a lot more confidence and you say, aha, there's something going on. We can think about policy and try and change it. So it is very important to be able to replicate your findings in, in another population. So that is what Interlace um, has enabled us to do. So one of the, my uh, favorite topic is, again, looking at reproductive factors. And the first thing is, I'm going to give you an example of what are the factors that predict premature or early menopause. First, what are the prevalence? What are the factors that predict it? And then the health consequences of premature or early menopause. So the first uh, paper that we uh, did was published in uh, 2017. Now, I must admit that Interlace data set took about three and a half years to harmonize. <laughs> so we had all these data sets, but it took such a long time to produce our first paper. But now, you know, it's a, it's a well-oiled engine. So the first uh, paper we did was we wanted to look at what are the factors that influences the risk of premature and early um, menopause. This uh, work was um, translated in 22 languages. And... I think for the first time, we will be able to give a prevalence of, uh, first of all, early monarchy. We know that as uh, in subsequent generation, age at monarchy is going down. So in this population, we have about 14% of the women had monarchy before the age of 11 and under. So that's early monarchy. 
We also, in this population, have about 11% of the women had no children. So they were married, but they didn't have any children. And in this generation, we think it's because they can't have children. Um, so it's, it's, it, the no child here could be a marker of not being able to have a, have a uh, child. So we have women, early monarchy, no children. Let's look at, first of all, the age, um, the distribution for age at menopause. Now, 2% of the population will have menopause before, natural menopause before the age of 40. That's not, a, not good news. Um, the average age of menopause is somewhere between 50 to 52 is, is considered average. Um, and about 8% of the women will have early menopause, 40 to 44 years old. Now, if you want to study the group bit, uh, who has menopause less than uh, 45, which is premature and early, you do need large numbers because the prevalence isn't as great. So we've got that. We put it out that you know, people didn't even know what the prevalence was for um, early premature menopause. Now, what I want to share with you is this result um, that is really surprising. So on the x-axis, you see age of menopause. So I'm looking at women who have had, um, say, this is premature menopause. Okay, so who are the women at risk? What we found is that women who've had early monarchy, so they had their periods first time before the age of 11, they didn't have any children, they are more than five times the risk of getting premature menopause. All right, and you've, uh, we've adjusted for a whole bunch of things that could be associated with premature menopause. So this is giving us a hint that, you know, monarchy, so the reporter asked, hey, you know, what can we do? Because monarchy is already finished. What can these women do? And I think the woman needs to know that she's at increased risk of premature menopause. So if she's smoking, try and stop smoking because smoking will bring it even earlier. That sort of thing. So try giving them the knowledge and hopefully be able to help them out. So this is, I think, quite a strong result to show it's five times we, we can present that statistics. Then we say, well, you know, what, what is the consequence of uh, premature menopause? So... This is the paper that was uh, that's published this month in uh, Lancet Public Health. And here what we did was we look at the relationship between natural menopause and uh, the risk of incident CVD. So in other words, this woman had menopause and then later on after menopause, she develops cardiovascular disease. Okay, so... It, it uh, got a lot of attention from uh, the media, it was last week, including um, on News GP. What do we see? Okay, so this graph really shows that um, on the x-axis here, you see these are the age of menopause. So this is our group, the premature menopause, and you find that, okay, women who've had premature menopause, she's at 1.6 times the risk of getting CVD after menopause, sometime after menopause. And this is known. I think people know early menopause, CVD, incident CVD is known, right? But what we can do with large data sets, so remember now we, we are working with data that's of 300,000 women. And what we can tell you is this, okay? And this, I think, is really important. That's the sort of things we should be doing. Women who have premature menopause, she is almost twice the risk of getting her first CVD event before she turns 60. So you could, you could do that kind of, be really precise. Before 60, this is what's going to happen. What else do we need to do? You know, we, we know it. So it's up to the health professionals and everyone to try and do something about it. So that's one thing. And then she, you know, early menopause is also at risk. And then they're also slightly at risk at between 60 and 69. But most of it is covered in 60. So we think they need to be considered. Um, it needs to be monitored closely. But the other thing also, I think I want to challenge this, especially with uh, people who are doing prediction modeling for CVD risk. Please take into account 
female specific risk factors. They're telling us something. Why aren't we doing anything about it? So this is the whole aim is do take those into account. The other thing also very um, glad to say that, you know, late last year, uh, we were funded the NHMRC Center for um, Research Excellence in Women and Non-Communicable um, Disease. So not only does it allow us to do detailed research on NCDs and the resultant health service use, but key part of the work is to develop partnership and collaboration. So I know Gene Health is a key partner on this, so that we can translate the no new knowledge into a much more integrated approach to preventing and detecting NCDs. These are all the, uh, <laughs> from interlace, you know, uh, that's what we have to uh, acknowledge everybody. But also I want to make special acknowledgement to my PhD student, Dong Shan, who is, you know, super genius in analyzing all those data, and also postdoc, uh, Shin Fan Chung, who's been working on that. But the other thing, before, I just want to end with this um, article that was just published in the conversation this week. Um, and it is about uh, what is defining what is perimenopause, what happens to women uh, during menopause, and how does it affect health. So this is just for your information. So with that, thank you so much. Good morning. Um, so it's actually brilliant to go off to Gita, or kind of, not exactly. <laughs> but um, I, I think that possibly a lot of what we're doing, um, what they, there's a natural progression of things. So I, I work in women's cardiovascular disease, a little bit from an epi perspective, a little bit from an advocacy perspective, and a little bit from a pathophysiological perspective. So I'm going to put those little bits together in a little bit of time. Um, so my fellowship is based around women's cardiovascular disease and I will be going to the American Heart Association. So I will briefly mention what, what we're doing there, but also just the, the larger state of play. Um, so I start every talk with this and it sounds silly to everyone in the room, but it's really, really relevant at any cardiovascular conference you're at because there's a lot of people who say, why do we care? Um, so we all know that it's a, if not the leading cause of death in men and women but many other people don't know that. And it affects about 5% of women in Australia and about 200,000 of those have coronary disease. It's also responsible for about a third of deaths every year. Um, and it's also really responsible, uh, really important with respect to our dallies. So with respect to our quality of life. So if anyone doesn't believe it yet, you're probably not in the room if you don't believe it, but it's super important, it's, a, it's an issue. In anything I do, I always like to make note of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women because their cardiovascular mortality is double that of non-Aboriginal women in Australia. And we need to consider that in everything that we do. But what about the depth of the problem? So there are some key disparities in cardiovascular outcomes for women in Australia, and I'm just going to give some examples. So, you know, as cardiologists, what do we care about when someone has a, an acute infarct? We care about the time that their vessel is obstructed to the time that we leave that, we relieve that obstruction, right? Because the time is myocardium. We know that. That's what's important. So in Australia, and in fact internationally, we know that women will take an hour longer than men to get to the door with their heart attack. They will take longer than a man to get an ECG when they get to hospital. They will then take longer from the point where they get to that door to when a balloon is opened in their artery and blood flow is restored will be longer again. So at each of those time points, there's a delay. Non-surprisingly, that means that women have more complications. And we're talking about serious complications. We're talking about post-infarct complications that lead to morbidity and mortality. Women are less likely to have evidence-based interventions. So they're less likely to get a stent. They're less likely to get bypass surgery. And again, I haven't even started to talk about the disparities in our socially isolated women, our rural women, and our, and our ATSI women. So why do these gender disparities exist? Well, there's a few factors, and many people say, well, women are typically older than men when they get cardiovascular disease, and that's certainly relevant. There is poor prioritisation of cardiovascular disease by women and by physicians, and there's a lack of education and awareness. There's a, also a lack of understanding of sex-specific cardiovascular risk, which is what Gita spoke about, and it's one of my passions, so I'll be speaking about that some more. The poorly understood pathophysiology I'm going to touch on as well, because 
women are actually pathophysiologically different to men. And there's a, a lack of gender-specific research and gender-disaggregated analyses. And I work with Professor Mark Woodward at the George, and he's actually termed it the female disadvantage. Um, and if you haven't read this article, I really recommend that you do. It's a, it's a brilliant read that summarises a, a lot of the important factors. So as we know, in Australia, we all do pretty poorly with respect to our modifiable risk factors, our behavioural and our biomedical ones. And, you know, women are no different. We're overweight, we have high blood pressure, we have high cholesterol. But as Geeta also alluded to, and again, this is work by Mark Woodward and Sane Peters, um, is that some traditional risk factors are actually more potent in women. So, for instance, if you look at diabetes, women have a 44% greater risk of de developing heart disease in association with diabetes than a man does, and 27% greater risk of stroke. So they are more potent risk factors in women. And at a population level, relative risks like this are actually very relevant. Another thing that I've alluded to is awareness is low. So in women, very few women are aware that cholesterol puts them at risk of heart disease. Very few are aware that high blood pressure puts them at risk. And very few of our kind of young to middle-aged women are actually having a heart health check. So you can see it's all mounting up. We've got bad awareness. We've got a host of risk factors. And these risk factors are particularly potent. And I love this diagram. Again, it's, it's what Geeta alluded to um, because it speaks volumes about our lack of ability to predict risk in women and particularly in young women. So if you look at that grey panel, that's women. Red is those that will develop cardiovascular disease and those two over overlapping boxes there are our some of our traditionally used risk prediction models. So you can see how well we're going at predicting women who are going to have cardiovascular disease. Appalling. So we're not predicting these women. So what about clinician bias, as I alluded to? I've told you women take longer to get to the door, but once they get to the door, we take longer to manage them and, and we don't manage them as we should. So this is Australian data on about 90,000 people and the take home message here in the interest of time is that a woman is 12% less likely to have cardiovascular screening in primary healthcare as a primary preventative group than men. So we're not screening these women. And I've already told you our screening probably doesn't work very well either. Another really powerful, and I must admit this is international data, is, is around misdiagnosis in women. So again, take home point in the interest of time, are uh, that when some, a woman presents to hospital, she's more likely to get an incorrect diagnosis when her ultimate diagnosis is an acute coronary syndrome. Why does that matter? We get there eventually, right? Well, I've already told you that time is, time is myocardium, right? Time is outcomes. And what it actually shows is that women, so if you have an incorrect diagnosis, it actually confers a greater cardiovascular mortality over 12 months. So it's all adding up. It all makes sense. After you have an infarct or an acute coronary syndrome, women are less likely to be prescribed best practice high intensity statins than men. So secondary prevention, we're not hitting our milestones. So what about gender specific risk? Well, this is something I'm exceptionally passionate about. So hypertensive and metabolic disorders of pregnancy, so preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, eclampsia. Oh, you like the bladder? <laughs> Everyone's experienced it. So that's wrong. It's, probably, it's about 10% of pregnancies in Australia at the moment that have hypertension and about 4% have preeclampsia. So it's actually equating now to about, I beg your pardon, 30,000 women per year in Australia, every year at risk. These are independent risk factors for cardiovascular disease, renal disease, stroke, metabolic syndrome later in life, independent. Similarly, gestational diabetes affects about 15% of our women. Again, an independent risk factor for chronic diabetes and CBD. So what is the risk? This is not new. These data have been out there for decades now and there's large data sets. We've got CHAMPS data sets that, that, that report on a million women. And the kind of approximate risk is about three times the risk of chronic hypertension about twice the risk of ischemic heart disease, about twice the risk of diabetes, almost twice the risk of stroke, and about 1.5 times the risk of death. Now, 
I, I give you these approximates because there's a lot of interplay. So early onset versus late onset preeclampsia, a small for gestational age baby, prematurity and concomitant other risk factors will significantly increase your risk. The other point I want to make is this a risk for premature disease. So we said women develop cardiovascular disease a decade later than men, not these women. They're doing it on par. So this brings me very quickly to some work we're doing with New South Wales Health at the moment, and I apologise because it's just about to be submitted, so I can't show you all the results. But what we did is we wanted to look at New South Wales women. So we looked at just over 500,000 mothers, so 500 women who delivered almost a million babies over a decade in New South Wales, so everyone. We only excluded a very small proportion of women where we didn't have complete data sets. And what we did over a period of time is try and assess whether their pregnancy experience had an independent impact on their cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So as I said, about 10% of our women had hypertension in pregnancy, so gestational hypertension, preeclampsia or eclampsia. The women who had hypertension in pregnancy were as expected, slightly older, slightly more diabetes and slightly smaller babies. And we followed them up for a median of seven years, about 70% of them we had a decade of follow-up on. Now, the results are to be published, and I shouldn't really be showing you anything, but I do want to show you one small thing, because I think it speaks volumes. So if you look at this, HCP, hypertension in pregnancy, and if you look at the top, do I have, I do have a laser. If you have, the, the vast bulk of hypertension in pregnancy is late onset. Your relative risk of a cardiovascular event, major cardiovascular event, not minor, you've got to get to hospital is 2.5 times. To, to compare that our women for smoking is 1.9 times. So 2.5 times. If you had early onset, so that's 34 weeks, almost five times the risk. Now, in our cohort of women who were currently smoking, look at the interplay. Late onset, four times. Early onset, almost 24 times the relative risk. And this speaks to something that, is very, that I'm very passionate about that Gita kind of referred to, which is people say, we can't change the fact that they had this condition. So, well, you know what? I can change whether a woman is a smoker or a non-smoker. And what we don't understand very well is the complex interplay between traditional risk factors and gender-specific ones and how important it is for us to appropriately assign risk to women and to modify what we can modify. I'm not going to go over this much because Gita did, but this is UK Biobank data, which essentially says that we need to think about other hormonal factors as well. So early menarche, early menopause, a surgical menopause are all independent cardiovascular risks. And again, that's Mark Woodward's work there. Last comment with whatever time I have left. Pathophysiology is different. So not all cardiac disease is obstruction of a coronary vessel. There are some conditions that certainly have a gender preponderance that are very important and under-recognised. So I'm talking about things like endothelial dysfunction, microvascular disease, vasospasm and coronary dissection. These conditions affect women vastly more than men. They're very difficult to diagnose using our traditional pathways. We don't have good ways of understanding pathophysiology and we certainly don't have great evidence-based management. So already we've got a group of women who are presenting with recurrent pain without an optimal way of diagnosing them or an optimal way of treating them. So again, women are doing poorer. So this is kind of my, my summary slide with respect to some of the barriers that I think are there um, in improving cardiovascular disease for women. I think that gender-specific risk is super important and translating that risk. So currently women are not uniformly told about their risk and they're not uniformly followed up. So we need to be educating women, but we need to be educating health professionals and we need to be putting clinical pathways in. Um, lack of research I've barely spoken on or the systematic exclusion of women of childbearing age from research um, and a lack of kind of cardiovascular risk calculators that appropriately assign risk in young women and account for gender-specific risk. Thank you. Was I in time? And thanks very much to um, the Jean Hales Foundation for the opportunity uh, to speak today and for the tra Travel Fellowship. Um, Claire and I were talking at breakfast and wondering if our talks on women and cardiovascular disease overlapped, and they don't. You um, set the scene beautifully for what I'm going to talk about, so thank you very much for that.
Um, I'm going to talk about the, the importance of population data, which kind of follows on a bit from what you and from what Geeta was saying as well. I guess it works. So I was asked to sort of give a broad overview of, of my work. I'm a, a cardiovascular epidemiologist. Um, I walk, work sort of very broadly in what we call whole population data and particularly looking at um, population trends and drivers and determinants of different areas of cardiovascular disease in whole population settings, but also looking at subgroups within that. Um, I've got a fairly big focus on coronary heart disease, and that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today. That, of course, includes the acute end of, of that spectrum, which is heart attacks, but also goes through to the sort of stable and chronic end of, of people living with coronary heart disease. And overarching that is a use of linked health data um, to try and sort of get um, enable us to look at those whole populations. We've been very much state-based for a long time and with a shift to um, sort of linked data throughout the country, moving towards using uh, data from other states, so sort of looking at more quasi-national studies and also I've worked with some overseas um, sort of data such as from England. One of the focuses of, of my work and, and our whole group actually has always been to look at sex and age specific um, trends, rates and burden of cardiovascular disease because there, as we know, are a lot of differences. And it's sort of led to particularly looking at, for me, an age specific focus on risk factors and burden um, in women. And that's what I'll concentrate on a bit today. Again, Claire and others have sort of touched on this, but it is coronary heart disease, so I'm looking at that specifically rather than cardiovascular disease broadly, is a major problem in women. It is one of the leading underlying causes of death of women in Australia, so over 8,000 deaths in 2016. And it actually was the leading cause for many years, but we've done a good job at reducing mortality over time. And in fact, the leading cause now is um, dementia and vascular diseases. So we're still looking at a vascular relation there in terms of the leading cause of death. Over 20,000 hospitalisations for heart attacks in Australia in women. Um, and as Claire has alluded to, very much higher long-term sort of risk of recurrence and mortality in women if they do develop coronary heart disease, particularly if they do have a heart attack. So that's just sort of broad brush um, looking at the burden in women. So one of the issues about investigating coronary heart disease in women, and again, this has already been touched on, but in fact, women have lower absolute rates of coronary heart disease in men. And this has actually been one of the hindrances, if you like, to epidemiological studies, and I, I guess to clinical studies as, as well. Um, and I'll get to that in the next slide in a little bit more detail. Prevalence estimates are difficult to come by for sort of major chronic diseases like coronary heart disease. In Australia, we rely on national sort of self-report surveys, um, and we also rely on partial data sources, so like using hospital data, but that alone can't capture coronary heart disease because not everyone goes to hospital for coronary heart disease. So my issue about this is if we don't really know the true magnitude um, of the burden of coronary heart disease in women, how do we sort of adequately treat it, manage it, prevent it and provide resources? So for my end of the, the spectrum of research, you know, whole population data comes in here and it you know, hopefully provides us with more robust and accurate level data to answer some of those questions. So I'm sort of talking at one end of the spectrum um, you know, that I guess Claire and Geeta and, and others are kind of working across in this area. So to give you an idea of what I was talking about with lower absolute rates, so these are rates of first ever, so incident heart attacks in men and women in WA. The, the top line is in blue is men, the bottom line is women. So you can see there, there is a gap, okay? But having said that, and sorry, on this side is the number of heart attacks in men and women. Having said that, it's not an insubstantial burden. You know, a third of heart attacks do occur in women. So that's in WA alone over 1,000 heart attacks in one year. And this is first ever heart attacks. So, so if you add in the sort of recurrent heart attacks, you can times that by two or three. Um, so in, in, this has been an issue in that because there's lower numbers, when we're looking for sort of statistical significance over time, particularly looking at trends over time, um, it limits our ability to sometimes detect differences. And that's where whole population data does come in. This is some data that um, we have published and certainly not expecting you to sort of look at all the details of that table. But what we're, I was looking at was um, temporal trends in the incidence, so first ever heart attacks and acute coronary syndromes, and looking at it in men and women but breaking it down into different age groups. What you can see in the table is they've all got negatives next to them, so that means rates are decreasing, except for that group which has got a positive, increasing rates in women aged 35 to 54. So this is something that's actually been sort of seen in a couple of countries 
Um, the Norwegians published it. We, we've sort of published it from some English data. US have published it. So it's this, this sort of, I guess, a signal of, of perhaps what's going on at a population level in women, particularly in this younger age group. And sort of moving on from that incidence and developing a heart attack, but what happens in the longer term? Um, and Claire sort of mentioned outcomes. And, and one of the things about outcomes is we've been quite good at having data on short-term outcomes after a heart attack, so in hospital, 30-day outcomes and one and two year. But with the whole population data, you can, we can now sort of link it so we're getting longer-term outcomes. So these were out, eight-year outcomes. You can see the difference in those different outcomes. Recurrent heart attack, cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality, and the rates in women for each of those are higher than men. So one of the issues with those is when you do show that data, again, Claire alluded to this, women are older when they have a heart attack. So that's often given, you know, people will say, yeah, but women are older, so it's the, the effect of being older age when you have your heart attack. If you look at this graph at the bottom, it's a Kaplan-Meier curve. So this shows that by, um, just for women, and the risk of a recurrent heart attack over eight years, the top line is the 70 to 84-year-olds. So that's obviously higher, which we would expect. The two lines which overlap each other are 55 to 69-year-old women and 35 to 54-year-old women. So there's not sort of an age gradient. They are actually having a reasonably similar risk over the longer term of having an adverse outcome. So that, again, something to highlight, and I think it comes back to the issue of detecting risk in, in younger women and understanding that that risk is there and it's actually perhaps higher than we think. So, so gathering of some of this data has sort of led me on to looking at this specifically in adults aged under 55 years um, with the support of a Vanguard grant from the, the Heart Foundation. And my aim was to try and overcome this issue of, of smaller numbers, if you like, particularly in younger adult women. So trying to gather data from different states throughout Australia, um, including hospital data, mortality data, emergency data, which is actually incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, you wouldn't think so, but it is. So trying to build a data platform, starting with those states and hopefully adding more as, as I go, but with a particular focus focus on looking at trends in incidence and recurrence, mortality and risk factors in this age group and being able to then look at it specifically in men and women separately. And it is, for this type of thing, it, it is helpful to have both men and women, both of this age group but also older, so we can do relative comparisons. So, so far, the data platform contains about records for about one million women, which sort of equates to many, many more million records, so it's quite a large data set and, as I said, hoping to make that bigger as time goes on. Um, and so I don't have any sort of data from that yet. We've just literally had our first sort of data output. Um, but what I'm actually hoping to build towards is an even, even larger sort of data platform. And I think it comes back to some of the things that were mentioned at the start by Erin about what was talked about in the forum, and each of the speakers have spo spoken about this, is the need for really good data platforms to actually be, be able to investigate this. And this is sort of a my pipe dream sort of thing. We'll see if we get there. And it's it, again, it'll take two or three years to kind of build it um, and try to bring in more um, uh, sort of informative data sources that are going to actually allow us to drill down with the larger numbers into what's going on, particularly in temporal trends over time. And I think it probably relates back to then some of the issues that have been raised about um, life course factors and how that's playing out in the population as a whole. So hopefully I'll get to that one day um, and allow us to sort of look at it at, at more of a national level because, as, as I said, a lot of stuff these days is, is in this area um, is, is very state-based. So I'll leave it there and um, I'm happy to take any questions. But yeah, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. They immediately want to put down on things that we haven't covered that you really think we need to make sure we're capturing early. There is an easel up the back there that you can stick some sticky notes on or use the, the textures on your way out. Otherwise, we've got ones downstairs that we will also use over morning tea. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters and panellists for speaking to us today. Really enlightening. Um, and enjoy morning tea. Thank you. Thank you.